Professor Stephen Chan um, is world renowned in international relations, professor at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. And um, he was also the first keynote speaker at the first martial arts studies conference. Um, and so he'll always have a very special place in my heart for that reason alone. So Stephen, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. And you're on lockdown in London at the moment? Well, insofar as lockdown is not being flouted, but of course there's a, a minor release in lockdown today. Yeah. But we're still basically self-isolating as a safety precaution. Yeah. So um, you um, were the first keynote at our first conference and it really all it, it hinged on you and it hinged on your availability I thought I need I want to have a conference I didn't know how big it would be and I thought well who would who would be a great keynote speaker and it was you because you have such an interesting relationship with martial arts in the sense that it's been a central part of your personal life and your academic career has gone elsewhere but it's also been intertwined I mean you don't you're not primarily a scholar of martial arts are you? No, no, not at all. I mean, I'm primarily, officially, a scholar of international relations. I mean, I write that quite large. Uh, yeah. I spend a lot of time in Africa, so I teach African politics, uh, for instance. And I'm deeply interested in the different thought beliefs of the world. So I also teach religion and world politics. Uh, that's something inclined to get me into a lot of trouble, of course, right now. But because I spend a lot of time in uh, the Far East, uh, certainly over the years, then I have from time to time written about martial arts as its practice in the Far East, but also how the Far East itself is impacted by the West and by international currents. I mean, you can't teach Far Eastern martial arts in Africa, for instance, without some kind of interaction and some kind of influence from one culture, one continent to the other. So I'm very, very much interested in that kind of multiculturalism and that kind of intersection. I mean, as you would have heard at that keynote lecture I gave for you, the last thing I think is that tradition should be static. I mean, tradition is not a museum. I'm very, very strong on that. It has to develop. Otherwise, it has no value for our times. It's hard to develop tradition in a way that doesn't lose sight of some of its original values, but brings on board some of the international contemporary values that are now unavoidable. I think that's the trick. And so I'm prepared to write about that from time to time, but most of my writing is very, very much to do with international politics and international diplomacy. Yeah, I, I mean, I, one of the most, I mean, I think everyone has different memorable, they took away different memorable things from that keynote. The thing that stuck with me, and I've seen this a lot uh, in conversations with other academics in martial arts studies, is you did you, you did this you said you said martial arts don't change like this and you did for, for anyone who's listening you, you gestured like it's not like the rain through time it's it, martial arts don't change like this they change like this and you turned your hands so your fingers faced each other and, and martial arts so you, the martial arts develop in communication with other things that are happening at this moment it's not like one master then there's a, then a disciple changes something then a disciple changes something although that does happen but the motive of it the force of it is the communication with other things that are happening at that time. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case, and I'll stand by that. I had actually forgotten I made that gesture, but now you've reminded me of it. But even in Japan, for instance, Japan was not completely isolated. It had all kinds of influences from surrounding countries, from China, just by virtue of trading routes alone, and of course from Korea. And the martial arts that I primarily study from Okinawa well, Okinawa is a complete crossroads. Uh, you have all kinds of influences uh, coming backwards and forwards from China, from mainland Japan, uh, from Korea. And because of nothing else but trade, but also because of scholarship, because of shared religions, all of these things meant that martial arts was not exempt from this kind of crossover influence. So to think that anything is pure in itself and remains pure, what has been declared pure, is I think a complete misnomer about how culture intersects. I mean, I've got to Okinawa quite a number of times, and on a very, very clear day, because pollution has, of course, reached that part of the world as well, mm. but I can actually see uh, the outline of the coast of China uh, from one of the peninsulas in Okinawa. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just faintly visible in the distance. Mm -hmm. So this means that even a fisherman knew how to navigate to China. Mm -hmm. So the tales of people like uh, the Goana, the founder of Goju, uh, yeah. and other people going backwards and forwards to learn from southern Chinese styles, mm -hmm. the whole legend of, I regard them largely as Chinese pirates and mercenaries mm -hmm. uh, setting their ships into port in Okinawa. Uh, all of that, I think, meant a miscegenation of the arts. And of course, some of these cities, city-states in Okinawa, traded uh, with Japan in a very, very big fashion. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kyoto uh, was at that point in time uh, a major center not only of culture, but of international trade. Mm -hmm. so you can't go backwards and forwards without picking up influences, without being heavily impacted by what you see, yeah. particularly if you're a tiny island state and you go to the big smoke, as it were, you're going to pick up stuff. And it's this kind of interaction, mm -hmm. which has always fascinated me. And of course, it continues today. I mean, after uh, the end of World War II, we had permanent American uh, garrisons and bases and airfields in Okinawa. They didn't go away because of the intensity of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. They're still there now because of the perceived threat from North Korea. Mm -hmm. I've absolutely witnessed the effect and the influence of American students on Okinawan masters. It's not just that the old men in their wisdom are impacting upon young callow American servicemen. You know, a lot of these servicemen were young champions back home in America. Mm -hmm. And I've watched the masters learn one or two things from them. Interesting. Uh, this is often overlooked. Uh, you know, yeah. People are not blind to what they see around them. They're influenced by what is around them. Yeah, interesting, interesting. So you were, uh, uh, you were born in New Zealand and uh, did you study did you study your karate or different styles of martial arts in new zealand or or what's this what, what was your first encounter oh well yes it was in new zealand but i think i gave a, an interview at your first conference in fact your colleague dr judd uh, on exactly some of those aspects of my formation uh, i absolutely have to blame my grandmother uh, we called her the dragon lady <laughs> uh, just to we encapsulate that particular interview. Uh, she had been a swordswoman in her village militia. She was a bit of a, a militia leader mm -hmm. in the warlord era of the first part of the 20th century. You have to remember that China was in complete chaos at the beginning of the 20th century. What you had was the disintegration of the emperor system, all kinds of very valiant but not successful efforts to establish a, a modern republic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, very heroic efforts to do so. You know, the beginnings of a communist way of looking at things that all the same suffered all kinds of setbacks uh, with international helpers, I hasten to add. Mm -hmm. uh, but also because of the breakdown of lawlessness, because there's no one established government, uh, warlords or bandit gangs ruled the countryside. So to defend themselves, uh, the villagers took up arms. And my grandmother was, as I said, a a uh, militia leader. Mm -hmm. So she was a swordswoman. So when the family managed to make it to New Zealand uh, during World War II, I think they scrambled on a, a New Zealand troop ship as it was evacuating uh, soldiers from Hong Kong, literally just before it fell uh, to the Japanese. That made the long trek uh, from Guangzhou, uh, Canton, as it was called back then, uh, to Hong Kong and managed from the mercy of the soldiers and the sailors on that ship uh, to get on board. Mm -hmm. Well, they wound up in New Zealand. So I was born there uh, mm -hmm. to a refugee family. And basically, my grandmother insisted that all this kind of stuff was real. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, what happens, and I think it happens to every single young man, especially the firstborn uh, in the family, uh, you start to rebel at a certain point in time. Yeah. Uh, grandma, you know, Dad, Mom, I don't want this kind of shit anymore. <laughs> uh, I take myself off to the meanest, toughest, roughest, uh, most notorious karate studio in town that had that kind of reputation. But the teacher was a young champion. Uh, he taught in an experimental uh, fashion. Mm -hmm. It was actually the Malaysian branch of the JKA, the 
because it was Malaysia, it was overlaid with all kinds of influences from the Chinese community in Malaysia. Yeah. So essentially, it was a hybrid style, but because of the Chinese influences, uh, I could immediately recognize similarities with what my grandmother had been trying to teach. Mm -hmm. So that was really the beginning of formal instruction. By that stage, I was a university student. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was built upon the early uh, teachings of my uh, grandmother. Mm -hmm. And of course, what I regarded as the posturings uh, of my father, you know, the young bull who always wants to take on uh, the old bull. I could never beat up on my father anyway, no matter how hard I tried. He was as strong as an ox. Uh, but what this did was to take me through uh, basically an adult lifetime of going to different places, learning from different teachers, and being open to study different arts. Mm -hmm. Because of course, uh, if you have a Malaysian Chinese influenced JKA, it's not going to be straightforward Tokyo JKA. Yeah. So I was able to perceive the influences even in that kind of early formal formation. And so when I finally got myself to graduate school in London, uh, I wasn't just content with studying with JKA or uh, in those days KUGB mm. uh, teachers uh, in London. I used to uh, go to a Noida Dojo, for instance, and study with some of his senior students. Uh, but I took myself around. I basically bummed my way through pretty much every single dojo in London. Okay. <laughs> so, um... So you, I mean, do you still, do you, how, do you still mix it up with different people? Do you invite people into your dojo or, or I mean, what's your syllabus like now? No, no, in fact, uh, what we have in the Jindokai, which is the group that uh, I'm the chairman, of which I'm the chairman, I mean, we have a number of different styles, all led by people who've uh, attained teaching rank, proper teaching rank in those styles. So we study Shotokan, uh, I still practice the kata, Shodra uh, Nuru, the Okinawan star, Gojuru, uh, both as it's taught in Okinawa, but also the Gojukai variant that you get out of Tokyo. Uh, it was taught by uh, Sensei uh, Yamaguchi, uh, for instance, the so-called cat, very notorious figure. Uh, what we're looking for is not whether or not you're doing the kata exactly according to a particular school or particular teacher, but whether you understand the inner meanings of that kata, I mean, we're working very, very much in terms of bunkai. This seems very extreme and strange to most people. But we produce championship kata competitors, for instance. And let's make no secret about that. That show and choreography, it's mm. a bit like modern gymnastic floor display. Yeah. We have no shame about that. Uh, but we are very, very anxious that those same competitors who win gold medals in international competitions. Also back home in the dojo, when they're practicing the flashy side of their moves, also appreciate the deeper internal interpretations. Mm -hmm. Also, we're very, very anxious that those interpretations, those applications, uh, don't follow just some kind of set textbook. I mean, if you're a literature student, it's very obvious that when you read Shakespeare, for instance, uh, you can get a whole different set of meanings uh, mm. from Shakespeare, including meanings that Shakespeare himself had no idea about. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you take a play like Hamlet, uh, we now understand that Hamlet obviously had a Freudian complex, mm. uh, but Freud hadn't been born, of course, at the time of Shakespeare. There's a latter-day interpretation that makes complete sense. And yet you can't possibly go to an English literature course at university without being given a Freudian interpretation of Shakespeare's Hamlet. And it's perfectly valid in terms of our times. It would have been complete nonsense mm -hmm. uh, in Shakespeare's time. So what I try to teach my students is that, look, what you've got are a certain core set of principles I mean, the plot of Hamlet doesn't change. Mm. That's constant. Shakespeare wrote it, the storyline is the storyline. But the way you interpret it mm. changes with time. Mm. You can't change the storyline, but you can change the interpretation. Mm. For instance, now with certain self-defense movements, and we can interpret it to mean a disarm of somebody with a pistol. 
Mm -hmm. Well, crystals didn't exist in the time of the ancient Chinese martial arts or mm -hmm. the ancient Okinawan arts or the ancient mm -hmm. Japanese arts. That was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. and so how we deal with things now is very, very different with the way that we would have expected people to have dealt with them some time mm. before. Mm. And I think we have lots of misgivings. Maybe we've watched or made too many films about these things. But a lot of these things, uh, these so-called early interpretations, uh, were like uh, what we would now uh, regard as video games. They were fantasy. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, if I were an Okinawan peasant uh, and I was confronted by a samurai with a katana, mm -hmm. I'm going to die. <laughs> End of story. Yeah. I don't care if I've got a pair of tops or a bow. Yeah. I'm going to die. Yeah. So the whole idea of being able to resist these things mm -hmm. was part of the heroic epics of resistance, which very often were not very successful. Yeah. I remember when I, I went to a conference a long time ago when I was only just recently freshly minted kind of PhD graduate. And it was, there was a, a talk precisely about literature and the professor whose name now escapes me, he, his question was, for his keynote, was what does the artwork know that I don't? And I th at the time I thought that was a preposterous question. But now, like if I'm doing a kata or a tai chi form or anything, it's like, so I've been given this blueprint and it's now my job to, and I, this, this morning I was doing tai chi and I, and I was in this position and I was thinking about, I'll, I'll sit up a bit. So I was thinking about the number of times that this position exists. Yeah. It's like, it's nunchakus, it's an arm lock, it's a throw, it's, it's, it's everything. And it's just like, it's just this sort of logic here. It's this sort of thing. But like the idea that there's one interpretation of that. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a field of possibilities, isn't it? Indeed. And I've had this pretty much demonstrated on me, much to my discomfort and pain. Uh, exactly that movement, in fact, as well as a few others. Uh, when I was a visiting, I mean, I've been a visiting professor in Taiwan a few times, uh, and it's a very, very convenient springboard to go on to Okinawa before coming back to uh, Europe, for instance. Mm -hmm. But my students have always tried to find me a different martial arts teacher uh, whenever I go there. Uh, and on this occasion, they found the deputy of Chen Manqing, one of the most illustrious interpreters of the Yang style of Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. There's a variant basically named after Chen Manqing. And, uh, this was his younger, uh, his collaborator in his younger days. And so they arranged what I was told was going to be a private lesson uh, for me. We sort her up to the park and of course the master was waiting. Uh, but so are all his students. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, good. So we go through the form uh, a couple of times. You know, there has to be some courtesy before the beating up begins. Uh, and then he announces to his students, who are all lining up uh, in a very polite fashion, uh, look, we have here you know, uh, you know, Professor Chan, who's a very famous karate master. And we will now put on a demonstration of comparison uh, for you. And of course, when they say, let's compare, you know you're going to die. <laughs> Uh, at the same time, you're mindful that you've got some pride, so it's impolite to beat up on the master. Mm. At the same time, you've got to make him work. Yeah. And so the master says, so please attack me as hard as you can. Mm. And I thought, well, I better make a good show of this. So I steam in, I'm not meaning to hurt him, but I'm not exactly being gentle. And the next thing I know is I'm flying all over the park. And so I think I'm losing face here. So I ramp up the attacks. He keeps encouraging me to have a go at him. Mm -hmm. And every time I find myself flying all over the park, and I'm thinking, what's he doing? Mm -hmm. uh, and you only really realize what he's doing in retrospect when you mm -hmm. recreate it all late at night because you can't sleep. Mm -hmm. um, basically, all of his hand movements are straight out of what we would normally call an Aikijutsu or an Aikido playbook. Okay. Uh, you know, but he's not moving like an Aiki master. He's not doing the ten counts. He's not basically using any footwork at all. Mm. And this really, really mystified me. And what I came to understand 
I constantly replaying in my mind and trying to picture it over and over again in my mind. And he was 72 by this point in time. It was the utter fluidity of his waist. Uh, he could do with his waist what an Aiki master has to use a tenkan to be able to do. The pivot, the step and the pivot that you get out of an Aiki master, he could do in place solely by mm. turning his waist and dropping his weight mm -hmm. while he was turning his waist. Dropping his weight and then extending his weight forward as he came out of his waist turn. Now, that's impossible to do without a lifetime of mm. cultivation. Mm. Uh, at the same time, the projection of energy he got out of a fully subtle movement left a profound impression on me. Now, you're not going to get any Tai Chi teachers, I'm going to say that uh, in Britain, mm -hmm. you'll be able to teach you that because none of them can do it like that. Mm -hmm. This was one of the great pioneers of. Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. And it left such a profound impression. And of course, it leads you to ask the question well, how authentic is what the other Tai Chi masters, how authentic is that, what they're teaching? Are they scratching a surface and then passing that off as authenticity? Mm -hmm. But of course, you have to realize that not everybody can be the perfect master. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been very, very fortunate in studying with people who've come very, very close to what. Uh, you would call a level of at least very near uh, mm. perfection. Mm. Uh, but sometimes we're making the best of what we get. Mm. What I don't appreciate is when we fetishize that and say that this is absolutely gospel. It's mm. not. It's somebody's effort to come close to being gospel. Mm. So, I mean, this leads to the question of, you know, we're all very busy people. We've got to hold down jobs like someone like yourself is traveling around the world on all sorts of different for all sorts of different purposes. And a lot of people as they get older, not just academics, but all people, they, they don't have enough time to train. So how do you manage to, to maintain the academic responsibilities and roles and, and your institutional roles and your international roles and keep up your training? Well, I, I run a very large martial arts organization. Uh, we have 50 dojos around the world. It's all on a non-for-profit uh, basis. There's a sister charity which disperses educational and health aid uh, to karate students, young karate students in some of the countries in which we teach. I've been the dean uh, of three faculties in British universities, which is like being the vice president of a corporation these days because even the smallest university is going to turn over 100 million per year mm -hmm. and that's pretty much like a small corporation which means that all your time is spent with lawyers and accountants nothing academic about it mm -hmm. as well as well as keeping up a full academic practice of teaching and writing as well as my private practice in terms of diplomatic work uh, which is a pro bono uh, free of charge activity uh, for governments with uh, whom I sympathize, mm -hmm. including from time to time, I hasten to add our own government here in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So basically, you're looking at about five full time jobs there. But I train every day, mm -hmm. and it's at least an hour, it's an average of 90 minutes. It's certainly getting harder now as I'm mm -hmm. getting older, and that happens to all of us, of course. But you've simply got to ask yourself the question as to, well, what does this mean to you? Mm -hmm. uh, if it means enough to you, you're going to carve out the time. Uh, a lot of people will say, oh, but Stephen doesn't have a life. <laughs> you know, I, I find it very, very hard to hang out in the normal fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever the terms young people use now, you know, chillax, whatever, whatever. <laughs> What's that? <Yeah. laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, you know, just hanging around doing nothing is very, very, very difficult to do uh, for me. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that's a bad thing. Uh, maybe I learned, learned, to lead, you know, learned how to do that more. Uh, but really, it's a life of momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, you reflect as you move. Mm -hmm. uh, when you move and you go to different places, you're always trying to learn mm -hmm. from other people, mm -hmm. from other professions, from different age groups. In case of being open, being alert, 
And I think all of these things rub off onto your martial arts practice as well. So even when you're doing all of these other things, just the idea of alertness, being aware of your surroundings, mm -hmm. uh, what the Japanese would loosely call uh, zan shin, uh, for instance, an all around awareness, uh, that's a lifestyle that feeds into your martial arts practice. You know, you know what's going on around mm -hmm. you. It's your job to know what's going on mm -hmm. around you. And I found that very, very beneficial. So although I'm very busy engaged in so many different things, uh, in a very curious way, those different things lead to a much more integrated lifestyle than most people would imagine. Mm -hmm. And in this integrated lifestyle, martial arts practice is just a, a natural part of what goes on with everything else. So yeah, uh, after I finish talking to you, I'm off to the park. Uh, I'm going to do my exercises. Um, I'm going to wear a mask. I'm going to be a good boy. Uh, I'm going to go through my routines, do my kata, all of the kinds of things that you would normally expect any martial artist to try to do in a dojo. But of course, the dojo is a shut right now. You know, I find a secluded corner of the park. Mm -hmm. I'm socially distant from everyone else. I don't care if everyone is looking at me. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to do my thing and try to be dignified and not fall over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the one thing, isn't it? Don't fall over. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you, um, you, uh, which way to phrase this? So you, you, you were awarded an OBE for services to Africa. Um, and you once recounted, um, I, I forget which article or, or where it was that I read this, and it was, I think, on one of your early trips to Africa, and you were you saw some people practicing a style of karate, and they had no teacher, and you were like, "Oh, I'm, I know this kata, or I can show you how to do this," and then, and you just ended up starting to teach people yep. kind of by accident in different places, going, "Oh, I know that kata," or like, you know, "Do you not have a teacher or whatever?" Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it was just as you say, a total accident. When I went to Africa, I had no wish whatsoever. Uh, to be a martial arts teacher. I'd gone there as a diplomatic uh, actor. You know, I was involved in development issues and conflict uh, resolution issues, which is a very polite way of saying standing in the middle of war zones and hoping no one would shoot you. Uh, so uh, the last thing I had in, on my mind uh, was that I should teach the martial arts. Now, I'd been the assistant instructor back home in New Zealand at the Hombu Dojo. Uh, of my instructor, he had a, a large... Uh, a series of schools. So I had some martial arts experience in terms of teaching, but that wasn't my ambition. Uh, I have to be very, very frank. And that is when I left New Zealand, my basic idea was get to third down and retire. Mm. You know, a typical young man's uh, ambition, okay, you know, get to third down is a nice level, win a few medals, um, then start growing up and you know, being an adult and doing adult things and have a serious life. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't quite work out like that. And I really do have to thank or blame uh, Africa for making sure that retiring from the arts uh, in my 30s uh, didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, people obviously wanted instruction, they were very serious. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them. Uh, became lifelong friends and from way back uh, uh, from the beginning of the 80s so we've been together for you know uh, more than 40 years now mm -hmm. uh, so you're looking at something which has been very very fulfilling mm -hmm. and at the same time something that's been very very helpful uh, to me the amount of experience that you gain from that and what it's led to because it's been a teaching career uh, 40 years of you start from the African experience, but uh, longer than that, if you count the assistant instructor uh, experience back in, in New Zealand, uh, it's led to the creation of an organization in which every single member group uh, has a teacher who's either been taught by me or by one of my senior students. We're not an affiliating organization. We don't just take people in. Everyone's got this personal connection. Mm -hmm. And as I say, we've got over, well, we don't really count because in Africa it's almost impossible to keep mm -hmm. a decent count. But well over a thousand students and you know, probably about 50 dojos around the world, which makes it a medium-sized uh, martial arts uh, organization. 
And as I said, it's all done uh, without charge. Uh, in fact, I and some of my close friends put in the money to keep it running, particularly on behalf of the poorer countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've got here something which is fulfilling because you see people developing. And particularly in the poorer countries, um, the old adage uh, that you got from the American ghettos of boxing your way out of the ghetto, well, look, uh, kicking your way out of the slum is not a, a bad uh, comparison. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, we encourage uh, these people who do well to go on to education. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll pay for it. Uh, you know, you want to become a mechanic. Uh, okay, we're going to pay for your city and guild certificate exams. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to pay your polytechnic uh, fees. Uh, you just get a black belt first mm -hmm. to show us that you've got some serious discipline. Mm -hmm. And that's your qualification to be considered for some kind of bursary to help you with local fees. So it works very, very well. Um, and we make a point of helping men and women you know, with developing female black belts. Mm -hmm. And we partner other martial arts charitable efforts. Uh, we're partnered with uh, a group called Fair Fight operating out of the Netherlands that especially caters for young female karate students in disadvantaged areas of the world. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, we've given a lot of money and help and personnel at the Fair Fight. And someone who's now uh, very highly regarded in the WKF rankings, uh, Alton Brown, for instance, uh, who is a contender, a genuine contender for a medal, should we ever have the Tokyo Olympics. Mm. He's now involved with that and has gone out to uh, Varanasi, a city in India, to help the disadvantaged uh, young women there. So that kind of thing, finally, is more rewarding than all the championships. Mm -hmm. In every single country in which we're established, we've won the national championship. Uh, almost all of the major teachers have won international medals of one sort uh, or another. I mean, I myself am still on the international circuit, although I very much hasten to add at the very politely labeled master's level, which means for the old codgers, uh, <laughs> we basically call it the Zimmer frame uh, category. <laughs> Uh, but basically what it means is that if you're going to encourage your students to do this kind of thing, as well as learning the traditional side of things, and as I said, we're very big on that, uh, but if you're going to encourage this kind of crossover, you better be out there showing them. So even if you don't win anything yourself, the fact that you put in the time, uh, you went on the diet, you made the weight, and you went in there, uh, you, know, you did your carter, you took your bruises, uh, all of that, I think, uh, maybe I'm speaking rashly here because there will come a time, obviously, when I won't be able to do this anymore. But I do think that a master of a large organization has got to do this. If you don't set the example, mm. you know, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Are you going to be one of these people who stands in front of the class or sits in front of the class barking instructions while you grow fat? Mm -hmm. The day that happens, I'm retiring. Thank you very, very much. Okay. And then in, in terms, I guess finally, because I know that, that you're very busy, <laughs> I'm, I'm gathering, um, and you want to get training as well while the sun is out. Um, you, you have written some works that focus specifically on, on martial arts. I mean, do you, do you think that you'll go back to writing any academic stuff or any, and you've written some literary um, pieces as well, haven't you? I mean, do you, do, what are your plans in terms of writing around martial arts in different ways? There are no plans to write anything substantial on martial arts. Right now, so far as I am saying or writing things about martial arts, they're in interview format, like what you're doing right now, for instance. Yeah. Uh, I recently did uh, a long interview with Patrick Vosky of the English Goju Karate Federation, for instance. So that kind of thing, uh, certainly. Uh, putting pen to paper in a sustained fashion, uh, there's nothing planned uh, along those lines right now. Maybe one or two shorter words, but right now I'm trying to write three academic books for three different publishers. And you yourself know as an academic, it really is now a publish or perish world. Mm -hmm. You better get the numbers out there and they better have what uh, they mysteriously call impact factor. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're dead. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're a ranking professor, the way you fall from grace is so rapid, it's ridiculous. 
particularly in these times when university life is becoming more and more difficult and will become more difficult because of the after effects of the coronavirus. Uh, basically, our lives now are making our quarterly numbers like any other profession. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy writing and I enjoy, um, I must say, shamelessly negotiating with the publishers. Again, uh, you're quite prolific, so you'll know exactly what that involves. Uh, but it does mean less time for writing on martial arts subjects. But I'm always very, very happy to make time to be interviewed by people who know what they're talking about. Uh, and you do, and not everyone does. Uh, so this kind of contribution, I'm very, very happy to make and do. Well, that's wonderful. And um, it's been really great to speak to you. I was just thinking it's been five years, actually, since since we first met, since the first conference in, in Cardiff. And I mean, things have... I was just looking at that, that your keynote before, uh, well, before my internet went off about 20 minutes before we were, we were scheduled to talk. And you, were, you said then this is going to be the start of something, whether you, whether you like it or not, it's going to be the start of, of, of a new field. And it has been. And before you sign off, can I say something which might embarrass you in front of the people who might be watching this? Okay. I mean, in that time, in those five years, you've not only written a very great deal more, uh, but you yourself have now been promoted to a full uh, professorship. You have pioneered the start in this country of formal martial arts studies. Uh, I think that your viewers and listeners should appreciate your accomplishment and what you've done for all of the rest of us in establishing foundations and fora by which we can really come to appreciate some of the deeper meanings of the martial arts in our modern difficult world. So I really wanted this interview not to pass without <laughs> my taking the opportunity to say, well, look, Paul, uh, thanks so much for everything you've done for all of us. Well, well, thank you for twisting it around at the end there. That was, um, yeah, lovely. No, it's, it's a real, it's always a pleasure and it's, it's wonderful. You, you're an incredibly generous and, and helpful uh, colleague. And it's great to talk to you again. Maybe we'll chat again in five years' time, eh? Well, let's make it four years rather than five. Okay, let's, okay. let's do that. Okay, okay. okay. Professor Take Stephen care, Chan. young man. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye.